Hey Bookaholic, so welcome back to another video. Today I am bringing you a dedicated series review to The Memoirs of Lady Trent by Marie Brennan. series is a series of epic fantasy novels that detail the life of Lady Trent, also known as Mrs Isabella Camhurst, who is now a renowned scholar in the field of dragon naturalism, or she is a dragon naturalist. She's written many publications and books on dragons and is the, one of the most respected members in her field. However, before she got to be this renowned figure, she was a young woman in a society that did not admit women into academia and it is how she fought her place into becoming an academic and studying what she loved studying and we are following her life as she becomes the person that she is renowned to be today. It is set in a Victorian style fantasy. It is a high fantasy so it's not set in our world but the society is very much based upon the Victorian era or the late 1800s and it is set on a somewhat global stage we do go to multiple countries the country that Isabella is from is very clearly based on England but we do go to other countries and see other cultures and it's a really fantastic series because it has that air of romanticism that we have of the past or still very much delving into all of the problematic things that were happening during that time in our history the author did a really good job of finding that balance between it being a really immersive world being a, a familiar world even though it's a a high fantasy but also not over romanticizing it and being capable of addressing some of the atrocities that were happening during that time. For this review I am going to go through each of the books because they do have different settings, they do discuss different things and I think that I would be doing an injustice to the series if I just tried to talk about it all as a whole. I am going to be doing it spoiler free so none of the books are going to have spoilers however if you find content warnings spoilers so for example if it details colonialism for example then in that case those would be spoilers because I am going to talk about the content warnings and the things that are discussed but I am not going to talk about any of the plot spoilers spoilers or character arc spoilers etc. So do with that what you will if this is a review that you think will make you want to read the series more or if you have already read the series and want to discuss it then welcome. If you do find me discussing things like the content of the book in terms of what it discusses and some of its themes then I would recommend that you go read the series and then return when you have. <laughs> Starting out with the first book, we have A Natural History of Dragons, and this is the one where we have Isabella as a child in the beginning of this book, and how she develops a love of learning, a love of dragons, and an interest in not just the theoretical, but the physical learning about these creatures. And I think that that was a very good development for this character because a lot of the time you just kind of get in passing comment, oh, they've already always loved this thing. But it was really nice to actually see that develop slowly. Her relationship with her family was also very interesting because if you are building up a character who is going to defy expectations, you need either a supportive family, a family that you're going to cut off, maybe a mixture of the two, or you have your typical orphan trope. In this case, I think that her relationship with her family was very, very well done because you can see how she would be the kind of person who feels capable of defying those expectations without actually killing off her family or it being like she is completely cut off from her family and, and they're never spoken of. Maria Brennan incorporated the family element 
Jen and the positive influences and aid that she would get from her family as well as any strife that it may cause, any disputes that it may cause. I think that it was really well balanced and felt very grounded and realistic. We then proceed to her marriage and how she specifically selected a spouse not based on romance, not based on attraction, not based on wealth, based on someone who would potentially allow her to pursue her studies. And the relationship that she has with her husband was a very interesting one. I did very much enjoy that. And in this book, we end up going to Vistrana, which is very clearly based on Eastern Europe, or at the very least, Northern Continental Europe. So not necessarily Scandinavia, but either Germany, Prussia, Belarus, that kind of area. I really appreciated this because it very much detailed the 1800s Eastern Europe in a different light. It wasn't just Imperial Russia with all its glitz and glam. It wasn't Anastasia. It was very much like from the perspective of these small remote villages that are clearly under the rule of these ruling classes that they never see. So they have to adhere to laws made by people that they don't see, that don't ever come out to these places. And it was a very interesting discussion around imperialism and the effect that imperialism even has on its own people. A lot of time when we talk about imperialism, we see the expansionist issues and the problems that come from trying to acquire more and more landmass, more power over more states, etc. This first one was very much discussing the problems that imperialism pose for their own people, for the people who are in the same landmass as them. It was a good discussion. We also have things like rural superstition. Instead of it being put down always to, oh, the folly of the country folk who believe anything, and more just, where does this superstition come from? Why do they feel these fears? It tackled the idea of the gullible peasant really well, because it was very much like the superstition comes from somewhere. It was a really good discussion, debunking a lot of the issues that we see when we discuss peasantry and like the country bumpkin notion and like the the fact that because they don't have the type of academic prestige when it comes to education that therefore those people are unintelligent. It discussed a lot of things like that and I really appreciated that and as a first book in a series introducing you to characters, introducing you to the world, introducing you to the type of dragons that we're going to be getting throughout the series, I think it was a really well crafted first step into what you can see is going to be a broader social discussion and, and I really appreciated that. Now this series and this this would stand for the whole series. It's not dragon fantasy as we are used to it. This is not Aragon. This is not you are going to be riding dragons and seeing the world on dragons. There's no epic battles or dragons just coming and, and burning down an army of thousands. There's none of that. That's not what this is. This is the study of dragons. Dragons here are very much just a very hunted, very desirable animal. And they are an animal. They are animals that are predatory. So they very much impose fear in less well defended populations. They are hunted for things like their bones, for their scales, etc. So this is very much a kind of conservation style novel as well, the, the discussions around, especially the way that Victorians and kind of century archaeologists and biologists went about studying animals, where it was like, we're going to study these animals to the point of extinction. It has those connotations to it. It's very much closer to Darwinism. If you were reading a fantasy book about Darwin and his study of animals, it's closer to that than it is to Aragon, even though it's got dragons in it. So if you are wanting an epic dragon fantasy, this is not it. This is a Victorian style animal studies fantasy. I really love that because I'm a little bit tired of some of the dragon tropes. I love dragons, but dragons have been done at nauseum. So I really appreciate this was a very gentle story about the study of dragons and along the way some social discussion, a bit of adventure and I really liked that. I really loved seeing Isabella come into her own as a character. You can see where she's going to go. By the end of this book you can see how much of Isabella is wanting to break forth and all of that social cages she's been put in. She is slowly breaking out of one at a time and I, I really appreciate that. Book two is The Tropic of Serpents and in this one we actually see Isabella heading off to what is essentially Africa. She's heading to what is known as Green Hell and this is a jungle in which there are some very specific dragons that she would like to look into. While over there she does end up becoming associated with the local tribes and begins to, to talk to them, to get to know them, to get to know their culture, their relationship with dragons. And one of the things that I really appreciated about this book is that you have different 
different societies and different communities with different relationships with these dragons. Some that deify them, some that fear them, some that are ambivalent to them, some that treat them like they are just simply other animals. You have so many different relationships with these dragons. It's not just a monolith of everyone fears dragons, everyone reveres dragons, etc. You have different groups of people who perceive these dragons in different ways. And I imagine that that is also due to the fact that they are exposed to different dragons. If you are exposed to these big terrifying beasts versus smaller, maybe less predatory, they're, you know, eating cats and mice type dragons, then you're going to have a different relationship with them. So I think that this book really set the stage for it to go very international, not just, you know, European, but like global, because it showed different cultures and, as I said, their relationship with dragons. And then also another thing that it did a really good job of is obviously we're in a Victorian style era, and this is say in Africa, well in Africa, and she is from England. It very much had discussions around colonialism, especially England's part in Africa. Some of the relationships of damaging a people's way of life solely so that you can acquire resources, for example, or the destruction of something sacred, again, for your own gain or your own resources. I really liked the discussions that were in this book. We also have questions around gender fluidity and around queerness in this series and how the soul is not necessarily gendered. There were some really interesting takes on it and it wasn't just literally you have a character who is trans or you have a character who is gender fluid. There were literal discussions around different societies and different communities perception of what gender is not just genitalia and not just like the way someone dresses or the pronouns they use but an entire community's relationship with gender and I really really appreciated that especially in a book that is trying to be Victorian in, in sentiment. We have the sheer feminism that comes in the first book and it doesn't just stop there it's very intersectional feminism. We have discussions around race in this book because obviously we are in a different continent and we have discussions around systematic issues and oppression and like I said the the way that you'll have a colonizer go and trample all over an established people you know with everyone whenever you hear the narrative of that you had the colonialists go in to civilize people or that you had colonialists go in because well they were all fighting amongst themselves anyway is bullshit because there were entire communities established in those places in those areas you had nomadic tribes who then could no longer follow their ancestral route because we had terraformed the land for our own gain and this book details things like that so freaking well and it really does have discussions, like I said, around gender in a different way, around race and colonialism in a different lens. So it's not just colonialism bad. Gender neutrality is a thing. It's It discusses a new take on it, a new approach to it, and I really appreciated that about this book. The next book, book three, is The Voyage of the Basilisk, and this one is the most Darwin-esque one. It is Lady Trent assembles herself a crew, she takes a ship. The vibes that I got from this one are Polynesian, but it could also be some of the South Asian islands. It's very much like tropical islands <laughs> vibes, and one of the things that was very interesting about this one was spirituality when tackling things like dragons because there are animals that to different cultures are sacred so I think the spirituality that came with the dragons in this one and sacred places and what trespassing on those sacred places means to those communities it was a very interesting topic and the discussions in this one are not quite so clean cut and easy to talk about without spoiling things but obviously also because we are getting into third book but the relationship again changes so you have people who clearly throughout many generations and, and a long long period of time have been revering these dragons so you have communities that have actually dedicated places and spaces to these dragons you have architectural constructs you have tech that have been dedicated to dragons so they are therefore deemed more sacred so in this one this tackles not only the spirituality of dragons but once again the imposition of colonial forces on these spaces on these sacred spaces the danger that that poses to these people's way of life and their way of worship again a very interesting way to tackle 
spirituality and it didn't create this notion of oh these silly people worshipping dragons it was very much like it was p portrayed as something beautiful something that makes these people perceive dragons in a different light and it wasn't done in that over spiritual they are magical kind of way you know you know like the early turn of the century depictions of Native Americans where it's just like they're more spiritual and, and in touch with nature than anyone else and it makes them like all hippy dippy it doesn't do that either it's real people with a very specific belief system that includes dragons. So it doesn't try and infantilize or mystify the people who believe in a, a religious system that includes dragons and at the same time it discusses problems that come with a colonialist society imposing on that belief. Fantastically written again, loved some of the interpersonal relationships in this one. We got some new characters in this one that I really really liked as well. This one definitely kind of upped the, the, the characters again because we'd had the same characters pretty much for a couple of books. We had one character introduced in the second book but everyone else obviously you have the ca the characters that are natives to the location that Isabella is visiting but ones that stay as a main part of the crew this is definitely one that has a really good new incorporation to the cast and I, I really appreciated a lot of the discussions. We also have international collaboration between an archaeologist and Isabella as well so you also have that different cultures approach to academia to studies to what is or isn't important because he's an archaeologist she is a scientist so it's how the two can work together and what their different priorities are so it's, it's overall again a, just a fantastic addition to the series <laughs> Book four, I think is my favourite in the series. I'm not sure. It's the one that made me like tear up a little bit at one point. And this one is set in an Arabic style setting. I'm not sure exactly if it's based on anywhere in concrete, but it's it's Arabic. You have a very Islamic adjacent culture in here. It's very conservative. It's, you know, men and women can't share spaces type of society. Again, done with just the app absolute utmost respect. There is no judgment in these books. It's not, well, look at this culture. Look at the misogyny in this culture. Because it's literally tackling, tackling misogyny within its own culture. So it's not a judgment at all on the, on the societies. It questions things, but it doesn't judge. And it shows people from these cultures that uphold these values and adhere to these values. It shows them in a wonderful light as real people, as characters that you love, that you can easily get behind and that's one of the things that I can definitely say about this series is that the way it discusses cultures different cultures there is never a isn't this culture just the best or uh well well you know this culture doesn't fit in the box of what westerners are used to and therefore it sucks or it's uncivilized or any of that there is no judgment on the cultures in this series it just presents them as is with flaws but as a very respectable society very much like the same it does with the false England. It's like, there's a class system, there's misogyny, and it does the same with all of the cultures. And it presents them in different lights. It's not, ha okay, but compare this culture to this culture. It's, this is this culture with all its bells and whistles. And I really, really liked that. And this one, it depicts war. It depicts a country that is in an ongoing conflict and studying in a space that has conflict. It also discusses colonial intervention in civil conflicts. So you have two somewhat tribes that are in contest with each other, they're in conflict with each other. And you have the discussions around colonial intervention and also withdrawal from those conflicts. Again, it, fantastic discussions, hugely relevant to today, for example. It's, it's a really good job of discussing how much we lose as a society in conflicts you think are irrelevant to you. The amount of loss of culture, loss of archaeology, loss of our history, the amount of loss of flora, fauna, nature, it really did a fantastic job of discussing preservationism and especially during 
times of conflict. And throughout history, we have lost so many things, so many texts, so many monuments, so many pieces of our shared history as the human species to conflict, to war. And it did such a good job of discussing that in this book. As someone who loves real world history. This book really spoke to me because it was something that I think about, something that whenever I hear about conflicts, I also think about the loss of culture that those people are enduring. If you think about the occupation of Ireland and the amount of Irish history that we have lost, like I don't, you don't even need to go further far from home. Occupying Ireland means that now the Irish language is depleted. It means that Irish history is lost, like literal pieces of Irish history are lost. Imagine what it's like in, in third world countries that we have been occupying for forever and killing their people for forever. People who are literally trying to convert to being mini British civilians without the rights of it. But you know, you need to act like a British gentleman, not wear the clothes of your people, not adhere to the faith of your people. You have to do what we say. And the amount of culture and social loss that happens in every conflict. Not only their lives, but their way of life, their culture, their society, their history. And this book did such a good job of discussing that, that yes, the loss of life is obviously the highest, biggest toll that they are paying. But even if they managed to rebuild, there are things that are permanently lost. There are things that have been lost to their society. Stuff that has endured centuries or millennia is lost due to conflict. And this book did a really good job of discussing that. The last book within the Sanctuary of Wings is set against a clearly Eastern Asian setting. And this one, it discusses a lot of topics in a much more they all feed into each other and essentially it is very much having a globalized society only works if it is a society of equals, which basically is another form of anti-colonial discussion. I think done in a very respectful way. It discussed, again, a different form of society, their relationship with dragons, same as, we, same as we've seen throughout the other books. And this one was very much wrapping together a lot of all of the thoughts that had happened throughout the rest of the series. And it was done very much in a way of should knowledge that technically belongs to a specific culture be divulged and shared to the rest of society? Does knowledge belong to one group of people? And I think that one of the things that this series does really well is that it poses these kinds of difficult questions without really giving you an answer, but without just brushing it off either. It's like, here's something to think about. Anyway, moving on. It's how can we as a society collectively answer these questions? How can we stop doing this let's agree to disagree and actually start trying to agree? And I think that this book in terms of topics potentially had the most work cut out for it in what it was trying to discuss while simultaneously doing a really good job of bringing together all of the things that have been mentioned throughout the series. So absolute fantastic conclusion to the main series. Fantastic character arcs and conclusions as well. I had such a good time knowing where everyone ended up. I loved the series. It ended on such a high without it being like epic, final, book it had the same level of interest and action in philosophizing as the rest of the series did she didn't just try and go out with a bang it was like consistently just fantastic level writing plotting and engagement throughout the whole series she did not need to end on a crescendo she just ended the series and i loved that because i was afraid of like because it's dragons afraid of some kind of epic ending and it didn't do that 
and I really admire that, the restraint to that, and I appreciate that. This does have things like brewing international conflict, so you do have kind of the, the initial trappings of war discussed in here, and what that means for us as a, as the human species, and I think, again, you do also have airships in here, you have blimps, or I guess they're zeppelins, I'm not sure, aerial warfare, but not planes, and yeah, overall, very fascinating series loved the main series so much absolutely fantastic conclusion then i also read its companion novel which is turning darkness into light and this one is following audrey who is isabella's granddaughter audrey wants to become a scientist herself it talks about having this kind of legacy, this this generational expectation of greatness, which I think was handled very well. We have this notion of trying to live up to other people's expectations of you based on your family, because her family are real chill. You know, it's Isabella, like, they're chill. But she is interested in something that is renowned within her family. And with her being the only girl, her not having siblings, it is very much she is put in a position of she is expected to, from the get-go, be the best in her field, instead of learning the same way any other normal person learns how to do anything. So again, fantastic discussions in here from the get-go, just based on the family. And then in this one, we are in a somewhat just before the breakout of World War II style setup. So we have things like espionage going on and it includes dragons. So in this story, this one is formatted differently. It's epistolary. We have newspaper clippings, diary entries and letters throughout the story. We do also just have standard narrative text, but we do have a lot of epistolary elements throughout. So this one includes things like espionage and it includes scientists especially and how anthropologists and archaeologists and historians get roped in to wars and to international conflicts and how their research can be used against their own people etc. So it was a very interesting discussion in this one. I don't think that this one necessarily lived up to the rest of the series in terms of its thematic use but there's so much that's covered in the other series because there's five books and this is just one. I think this was just a nice additional nice to see where the characters are at now nice to see where the world is at now a little final touch of okay so you have this going on with this character and this going on with the world and this going on with the society and this is where dragons and academia fall within all of that so a really good additional book i gave this one four stars gave all the rest five stars still a really really solid entry into the series i don't think that it's necessary but i am really glad that i read it anyway I love this world. I love the way that Marie Brennan goes about discussing things through this world. So very glad that I read it. Had a great time. Would still highly recommend if you're a fan of the series. And Audrey is a really easy character to follow. You have a conspiracy, more like mystery element going throughout this one, which again shook up the narrative style in a really fun way. Overall, this series is just one that is fantastic to get into. I think that some of the interpersonal relationships and romantic elements in there are also incredibly well done. Some things that are like really not talked about in that series. It's also not heavily romantic and yet the romances are very sweet and very organic and it doesn't necessarily happen in the course of a couple of chapters. I really appreciated so much about this series. Also, another thing that I forgot to mention is that Isabella is an artist, like she sketches for her books and therefore we get art throughout the series which I just think is so cool. Illustrated adult books are literally one of the most underrated things in the whole freaking bookish industry. Underrated and I love that this is illustrated. I love that we got some portraits of some of the characters. Let's see if I can find Isabella for you. There you have Isabella in all her glory. This is her 
throughout the series and this this is her now she's an old lady and she doesn't give a shit about what anyone thinks anymore and i really really love that absolutely fantastic series worth every single page beautifully simplistic and very realistic and raw writing style very much does feel like a memoir incredibly well crafted to set up where you have a fantastic amount of room to discuss social issues without actually stepping on any real existing cultures but very much respectfully drawing from our world and other societies which again really really great work that in my opinion discussions include like i said misogyny and we have gender fluidity and we have queerness and interracial relationships so we have lots of other social things that aren't to do with the political side of things like the colonialism or the imperialism so just a really really well-rounded series pacing is quite slow so do bear that in mind if you are going to be picking up this series because it's not a series that is action-packed it's very much someone waltzing around the world discovering dragons so there are slow bits and you know it's not the mummy it's not indiana jones <laughs> kind of archaeology it's slower it's more toned down and i really really love that but i can understand that's not going to be for everyone so i i would recommend that you maybe give the first book a try if you like that then continue because the pacing is level and, and even you have more thrilling moments or nerve-wracking moments you don't necessarily have huge alter in in pace so much so yes would highly recommend i think that for preservation's sake as well it discusses things like poaching really well it discusses environmental impact extinction through hunting unethical practices in science when studying things like animals it has so 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 many things that it discusses throughout the whole series in a fantastic and subtle way while still very much you know what she is trying to say with this there's no sugarcoating it but at the same time she's not cramming it down your throat and i just love that so so much because most of it's the story and then it's all woven in it's not one of those where she had a social agenda to discuss and she weaved a plot over the top of it to hide it she wrote a story and then within it arises discussions and i really love that so overall wonderful series would highly recommend hope you check it out i hope you liked this video i know it's not formatted in my usual style but this series really did deserve a discussion around each book instead of just like a general overview like i normally do so i hope that you you were okay with the format of the video i hope that you enjoyed and that you stayed with me till the end thank you ever so much for watching and i will hopefully catch you in another one soon bye y'all